Thanks, Christopher. Um, the format for today, we'll have um, opening remarks from our three panelists, and then we'll turn the time, open, time over to your questions. Um, this is being recorded for others to watch. Um, what we've asked the panelists to do, rather than pass the microphone around and disrupt the flow of the, the discussion, we'll ask, ask the panelists to um, restate your questions. Um, I'll, as moderator, call on people, and then we'll um, welcome discussion from the panelists or others that have, have comments. But we'll first hear from Professor Amr al-Azam. He's a visiting professor this year at Brigham Young University. He teaches courses in anthropology and political science. Um, he's also an observer of the Middle East and um, is interested in anything to do with the Middle East. He's originally from Syria. Um, our second presenter will be Eric Heyer. He's an associate professor of political science, um, teaches courses on Asian politics and international security. And then our third panelist is, to my immediate right, is Scott Cooper. He's an associate professor of political science and teaches courses on international political economy and Russian politics and also is doing research on, the econ on economic relations in the Persian Gulf. So we'll first hear from Professor Al-Azam. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, I just thought maybe a, literally a couple of words on why this all came about. Uh, I've been meaning to write a paper on this subject for some time, and uh, it became more imminent and important for me to do so as I began watching the debates on the television between your two uh, candidates, Barack Obama and uh, John McCain. And every time one or both of these candidates came on the screen, at some point, you know, th there's like a set of issues they have to cover, and, and they would cover almost in, 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 in an automatic, mechanical manner in some ways. And uh, whenever the Iran issue came up as part of, you know, are you going to be a strong you know, defender of the U.S. and how will you deal with potential threat of nuclear, uh, nuclearized Iran, so on and so forth, and then you'd get whatever sort of set piece answer you're expecting to hear. And what became very clear to me is that obviously for electoral, uh, electioneering reasons, the, the answers that we were getting were coming out, but there was a reality here that we weren't discussing, and I felt that it would be very pertinent to bring this up, particularly that we're coming up to an election, and I felt that we needed to clear the, the air a bit and uh, put some facts on the ground. Um, initially, I thought I would just do this as a one-off lecture, and then I thought, no, let's expand this and do this into a panel and bring some of our colleagues here and have them interact with yourselves as our audience, and uh, maybe I can get some feedback and to sort of throw back into my paper. So there is a personal benefit out of all this. So I'm not doing this for free, you know. Um, the issue of Iran uh, going nuclear, I mean, or let's put it this way. Iran and the West has had a very unhappy relationship ever since the fall of the Shah in uh, the late 70s. And uh, it's the replacement of the regime with uh, – with, uh, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini and the Islamic Republic. Um, this unhappy relationship has spilled into violence at various stages. And the reason why I'm saying this is because as a result of this, Iran over the last, mm, say, uh, 30, well, 25 years, has repeatedly felt threatened by the West in one form or the other, sometimes through direct you know, action against it in the form of uh, let's say encouraging Iraq or giving Iraq the green light uh, that's Saddam Hussein's Iraq, the, Saddam, the very same Saddam Hussein which we then decided was a terrible person and uh, invaded uh, his country for it. Um, at the time we felt that he might be a good candidate to help us out by basically taking out the then even more despised Iranian regime. So we encouraged him to go and invade Iran. And then uh, throughout the, Iran, the, the protracted Iran-Iraq war, we supplied him with weaponry, we supplied him with uh, intelligence, we supplied him with, with the international cover he would need to uh, uh, carry on this, this war. In fact, uh, the fact that in this war they ended up, he ended up not only gassing or using chemical warfare, the first time I think chemical warfare and uh, um, was used on a battlefield since the First World War, what would be on that um, battlefield 
and uh, the fact that he even gassed his own people is neither here nor there. Um, and so the Iranians have over the years built up a, a, a high degree of sensitivity to Western intentions towards their regime and have, uh, have felt this threat uh, sort of off and on in varying degrees. Um, most recent is in, uh, I can't even remember the exact date, I think it was in 2003 when Bush, President George Bush made his Axis of Evil speech um, where he places Iran firmly within that axis and uh, with a uh, much invigorated and, 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 and uh, militarily inspired U.S. who then sets out to um, invade first Afghanistan and then Iraq um, with some success initially because obviously, uh, you know, there was very little resistance to both invasions. Um, you know, the, the Iranians could sense that perhaps, the, you know, and, and, and the, the talk that was coming out of Washington was that we're on a roll here, and, you know, uh, today, Iran and Af today Afghanistan and Iraq, tomorrow Iran and Syria, and God knows where else we'll go after that. Um, so, these, the, you know, the, these were very unsettling times for the Iranians. And so what does a nation that feels threatened do? It seeks to defend itself. When I say nation, I should be a little more specific here. Um, I'm talking about regime. Okay, the Iranian regime is feeling threatened here. So what does it do? It seeks to defend itself. It seeks to find some means of um, alleviating this pressure that it, it feels under. And consider this. Not only um, is it feeling the pressure of threat of invasion, but now it's suddenly also feeling itself... Uh, geographically surrounded as well, because um, as of 2003, Iran now finds itself surrounded by uh, nuclear powers, if you want. To its east, it has the U.S. Army, um, which is a fully capable U.S. Army in Iraq. To its south, in the Persian Gulf, it has the U.S. Sixth Fleet, I believe, um, or is it Fifth Fleet? I can't, again, I'm not sure. I think the Fifth Fleet, which it certainly has... Uh, uh, nuclear capability to the uh, to its uh, west it has again NATO in Afghanistan and then a little further sorry to the east it has um, Afghanistan with NATO there which has nuclear capability but also it has a nuclear Pakistan okay Pakistan and its nukes are not facing Iran they are facing sort of India that's a very kind of set piece regional situation but it's nuclear and then to the north um, you have the leftovers of the uh, old Soviet Republic, namely Kazakhstan and the other stans that go with it, who, yes, at the end of the uh, Soviet era, they dismantled their uh, nuclear arsenals and got rid of most of their ballistic stuff, but there's still a fair amount of nuclear material lying around there. And whilst these uh, northern neighbors, these ex-Russian neighbors, have declared themselves to be nuclear-free, that not necessarily sort of remain so. And also don't forget you now have a, a reinvigorated Russia sort of near the borders as well. And uh, this sort of new Russia that's beginning to flex its muscles also is a, is a nuclear power. And then not, last but not least, you have Israel to the uh, southwest with uh, its own not insubstantial nuclear arsenal. So when the Middle East and its nukes was just Israel, it was relatively easy to kind of ignore. But once you have the U.S. forces in 2003, um, Iran really begins to feel surrounded. And I think it was... 2003 could be a turning point. The invasion of Iraq could be a turning point for Iran in deciding this is it. We have to develop our own nuclear deterrent. I'm not saying that this began in 2003. They, 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 they've, they've had this on-off relationship since, in fact, in fact, I think their first effort at... Uh, building a civilian nuclear reactor goes back to the times of the Shah. But they never really pushed it. They never really pursued this process with any sort of aggression until um, uh, sort of beginning, uh, beginnings of uh, 2000, 2000, 2000. And 2003 becomes then a, a really important time in which to say, okay, we have to do this now. We have to do this, you know, uh, seriously because there is a serious threat to us. The I would close on this by saying the following. For Iran to go nuclear would be a serious 
a very serious issue in the Middle East because it would start a nuclear prol proliferation. Um, I don't want to call it a race, but uh, a rash or, uh, you know, maybe it would be a better way, where suddenly all these other states that have avoided going nuclear for whatever reasons of their own now no longer feel the need to be kind of so... Uh, circumspect about going nuclear. I'll give you an example, Turkey. Well, Turkey, for many, many years, has, avoid, has been able to avoid the issue of going nuclear because NATO has said to it, don't, you don't need to go nuclear, we will guarantee your safety, you're a member of NATO, and so on and so forth. But with Iran going nuclear, Turkey may no longer be willing just to accept NATO's cover for this. Egypt might be another country you might start thinking about. In fact, they've already started making noises about being interested in a civilian nuclear program. And the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia and so on and so forth, may also suddenly feel, and they have the money to buy not only the technology, but to buy the know-how and, and everything else. Um, so countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like the Gulf, may also suddenly feel the need to start to go nuclear because of a nuclearizing Iran. Um, the... So that would be a, a very serious threat to the region and the stability of the region as a whole. Unfortunately, and this brings me to the, uh, to the crux of my point, is that really there's nothing we can do about it. Um, and I say there's nothing we can do about it for the following reason. And I would title my paper, if I, once I finish it, is Why Iran Must Go Nuclear. There's nothing we can do about it because... Ultimately, Iran is choosing to go nuclear for, a, a, as a mechanism of deterrence, okay? And in order to uh, provide itself with this deterrent, it needs to, uh, it, it, the deterrent is there to, to basically face off a, 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 a threat. And the only way they would decline that deterrent, or the only way they would turn away from that deterrent, if that threat were to be removed, and the only way that threat can be removed is in one of uh, two possibilities. Either Israel is disarmed, nuc I mean nuclear disarmament of Israel. That may be enough to satisfy the Iranians. And I cannot see that happening. Not because, um, just because the Israelis would probably refuse, but because we don't have the, either the political will in the West or the, even the, the capability to disarm a country like Israel. It just, it just, we cannot do it. So Israel's not going to be disarmed. There's going to be no nuclear disarmament of, of Israel. So that's not going to happen. And the only other thing that may appease the Iranians would be for us in the West to provide the Iranians with cast iron guarantees to their security as a regime. And that would also be too much for us. We, you know, there's no way, I cannot see the West providing Iran with cast iron guarantees regarding the safety of their regime and, 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 the, rec and the recognition of Iran's hegemonial presence and role in the region, and which would in effect be us giving up on everything that we've tried to do in the past 20, 30 years in the region, and handing the region over to the Iranians, um, which we're not going to. And short of one of those two options, the third option is that Iran develops a nuclear deterrent and uses that to hold the West at bay. Will Iran ever use that deterrent? 99.9% .9 no, because it's a deterrent. That's the whole purpose of a deterrent. You don't use deterrence. You just say, I have it. So if you, it's, it's a last um, resort weapon in the same way that Israel is no more likely to bomb its neighbors. Israel would only use its nuclear deterrent against its neighbors if it was a case of do or die. And I would say that the Iranian regime would do the same. Um, so Iran's going to end up going nuclear. Uh, this could very likely lead to nuclear proliferation in the region and further instability. And unfortunately, the reason why we've ended up there is because I believe we've mismanaged our relationship with Iran from the very beginning. That would be my piece. Let me get my water here. Um, well, I'm happy to be here this afternoon. Um, I do not have an ulterior motive. I came just because I'm interested in the topic. And I have some, um, some, some minor differences, or uh, not major disagreements with Professor uh, Al-Azam, but you'll, you'll understand as I go through my presentation. Uh, I wrote down some notes for myself. Um, 
the first question I always ask myself in situations like this is, is Iran a threat to the United States? And my answer to that is, is no. Uh, and that, that answer is based upon um, three, three points. First of all, United States intelligence, the most recent national intelligence assessment, says that Iran does not have a nuclear weapon, and nor are they developing one. Uh, that's the, the, the best we can go. Many people would say, well, they, they were also wrong about it. Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, so why aren't they wrong this time too? But be that as it may, you can choose to trust that or not. Um, second of all, while, while certainly aiding various uh, organizations, terrorists, and ter other terrorist groups, uh, there is no evidence that Iran has ever, th there is, th let me say, there is no evidence that Iran has ha ever handed off any kind of nuclear technology in these groups. There's no, no evidence, there's no case of what we'd call a nuclear handoff. So the, the likelihood of Iran, even if they had a weapon, of handing it off to a terrorist group I think is very unlikely. Uh, states that have nuclear weapons tend to, to hold on them very tightly because they are very important and they're not in the business of just handing them out. That would only bring uh, a threat to Iran itself. And thirdly, uh, Iran for the last century has never invaded one of its neighbors. It's been invaded several times, but it's never invaded one of its neighbors. Iran currently spends about 2.5% of its GDP on its military. That is half of what the United States spends. We spend about 5% of GDP on our military, and our GDP is much larger than theirs, of course, so the military budget is, you know, the United States military budget is larger than all other military budgets combined, basically. Uh, by comparison, Japan spends less than 1% of its GDP. And Japan also has a very capable military. So Iran is not uh, a great military threat in terms of an army. So in that sense, uh, Iran presents no real threat to the United States and certainly does not spend, present any kind of existential threat. Iran could not bomb the United States. It could not invade the United States. It could not attack the United States. The, the second question to consider is, is Iran, Iran certainly has a, some kind of program going. So is this a nuclear power program or is it a nuclear bomb program? Uh, certainly Iran has the uh, knowledge and the technology and the ability to enrich uranium, uh, a necessary ingredient to build a bomb. But uh, the most recent estimates are that it can enrich uranium to about three to five percent. This is necessary, that's a necessary enrichment for, for power generation. But you'd have to enrich uranium to about 90 percent in order to make a nuclear bomb, and Iran does not have that capability. So uh, if they may have been working that way to try to develop that in the past, uh, the best intelligence we have is they're not, no longer doing that. So that doesn't mean that they could not do it in the future, and, and I. I'm not saying that Iran wouldn't do it in the future. I, my, my assumption would be they probably would at some time unless something else happens to stop them from doing it. Uh, so Iran certainly has missile technology. It's tested missiles. So if Iran in the future could wed its nuclear capability, the ability to make a bomb with its missile technology, then it would be uh, certainly a regional threat, but may, maybe still not a threat to the United States if it did not have intercontinental ballistic missiles. It would not be a nuclear threat to the United States. So the key question I, I think we should ask ourselves is, what is Iran's will to develop a nuclear weapon, and what is their intention? Um, let me turn just a minute to a topic I know very little about, and that's Iranian domestic politics. Iranian politics is really a kaleidoscope of cross-cutting interests and ideologies. It's a very complex society. It is not a totalitarian regime. So those are, those, there are those in Iran who certainly want to develop nuclear weapons, there are those who might want, not want to develop nuclear weapons, and there are those who want to develop nuclear power. To assume that Iran is simply a, a, a country that is totalitarian in nature and dead set on, on developing a bomb is, is to completely misunderstand this very complex kaleidoscope of Iranian interests within the country. Uh, most people that talk about uh, Iran's domestic politics certainly want to mention Mr. Ahmadinejad, so I'll do that now. And, to my mind, Ahmadinejad is kind of the Sarah Palin of Iran. All apologies to you Sarah Palin groupies. Uh, she should probably return to pole dancing pretty soon, but. Um, anyway, Ahmadinejad, Ahmadinejad is much like Sarah Palin in the sense that he's a populist and he's an extremist, but he has little or no influence at all in Iranian politics. Remember, Ahmadinejad is the person who denied that the Holocaust ever happened. Um, that's certainly a bizarre denial, but remember he also denied that there were any homosexuals in Iran, which is also a very bizarre denial. So uh, he's in denial. Let's just let's re realize that. This is a man who has little influence in Iran, is losing popularity, and will probably not be reelected. Um, now, the question of war. 
should we go to war to prevent this potential Iranian nuclear power? Um, I believe that going to war would certainly unleash uh, terror beyond our imagination. Remember, Iran had a lot to do with inventing and developing suicide terrorism. It would uh, unleash war region-wide. It would not be limited to Iran. The conflict, it would be a conflict with really no limits in the region. It could easily spread to other countries involving Israel, Syria, the Gulf states, and, and beyond. It would also uh, greatly exacerbate the global energy crisis. Um, so we must ask ourselves then, for what purpose would a, would a war be, and what would the end game be? And I think our recent experience in Iraq should teach us a sobering lesson that uh, when we evade a country with uh, poor planning and poor reasons uh, and no end game, we end up in a, uh, in a terrible situation with uh, no good outcome for anybody involved. So I think we should always be very cautious before we contemplate uh, going to war to simply prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, we didn't go to war to prevent Korea from getting one. We didn't go to war to prevent India or Pakistan from getting a nuclear weapon. So I don't, know why, I don't know why Iran should move to the top of that list. It's no less or no more crazy than any of those, any of those other regimes I just mentioned. Which leaves us with another option, negotiations. Um, we have lost opportunities to negotiate with Iran in the past. Um, in 2001, uh, I don't think any of you remember but uh, when we invaded Afghanistan uh, after 9-11, the Iranians were a great help to us in toppling the Taliban regime. They helped arm the opposition to the Taliban. They gave us intelligence to help that. And at that moment, we could have um, probably moved forward in some kind of uh, negotiations with Iran to try to overcome the very difficult differences we have. And we do have serious differences, but we may, maybe could have overcome them because they were open to negotiation at the time, and they'd actually stepped forward and helped the United States in taking out the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, two enemies of the Iranian regime. A second uh, lost opportunity is possibly uh, just 2003 post-invasion uh, of Iraq. Iran was certainly stunned by the rapidity and the thoroughness of the U.S. invasion and the toppling of Saddam Hussein their you know, nightmare enemy for decades. They were awed by American military power. And at that moment, we could have sit, sat down with Iran possibly and said, look, now you know where our cards are and you know what we have in our hands. We should work to overcome our differences and try to move forward in a more constructive way that would benefit both of us. And Iran may have been open to that. So I believe that those are two lost opportunities for negotiations. When I think about this issue, I, I lapse into my own area of expertise, China. And remember that we, we, I, we attempted to isolate China for 20 years, from 1949 until 1969. We got nowhere. We only got a more radical China. But when we began to open up our dialogue with China, we now have a China that is a capitalist economy. It's fully participating and investing in the world economy and the world uh, global system, the United Nations, et cetera. We should have learned from that that uh, isolating countries uh, d never achieves much. We've now tried to isolate Iran for 30 years, and we have not got a better Iran. We have not gotten Iran that's more amenable to uh, international good behavior. So I would argue that we should move forward with, with some kind of negotiations. Um, I guess this would put me in the Barack Obama camp and not the John McCain camp. We should certainly, in negotiations, continue the involvement of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, to engage Iran and ensure that Iran does not violate the Non-Proliferation non Treaty. Iran is a party to that treaty, which gives them the right to develop nuclear technology for peaceful purposes, but uh, prevents them, forbids them from transferring technology for weapons and other things, or going nuclear with go, going forward with nuclear weapons. And there, you know, we, I guess I've already mentioned that we have evidence that they're not doing that at this point, but I don't trust them that they wouldn't in the future. Iran, like all states, seeks two major things, some kind of security and some respect. And we must address those legitimate issues. Iran certainly has legitimate demands for security and respect. And we need to do that in order to prevent nuclear proliferation. In other words, we have to address what I would call the demand side. 
Iran, as Professor Al-Azam has made clear, has serious security concerns. They are surrounded by nuclear-armed states. They are surrounded by hostile states. One place where I would disagree that nuclear – Iran began developing nuclear weapons in the 1980s when Saddam Hussein was gassing them and dropping chemical weapons on Iran, and the world was standing by and watching and not doing anything. They realized we have to be prepared to defend ourselves through a nuclear deterrence. And so we can tr trace Iran's ambitions for nuclear weapons back to the 1980s when they were seriously threatened. So we have to address that threat. And if we can address the threat of regime, regime security and respect, we can diminish their demand for nuclear weapons. Now, in, in a recent study that I was reading, uh, it was estimated that 29 countries have moved forward at some point in time to develop nuclear, nuclear weapons. And successfully, 18 of those countries have been rolled back away from that. So this is a possibility. You can list a long list of countries, South Africa, Kazakhstan, Switzerland, Australia, Taiwan, Japan, that have rolled back away from developing nuclear weapons once they started down that road. Libya, the most remarkable place in recent history, and that could be done with Iran also if we address the demand side and ensure them. So what would this require the United States to do? Really nothing more than we have done, than the Bush administration has done with North Korea after delaying for seven years finally last year coming to some agreement, basically saying that we will not launch preemptive war against your country. We will not attempt regime change in your country. And we expect you to not proliferate nuclear weapons or develop nuclear weapons. And we will then cooperate with you to develop your oil industry. Iranian oil industry is deteriorating quickly. Their infrastructure is falling apart, and they depend on that for national income. One of the reasons why they want to develop nuclear power is to compensate for the lack of income and the lack of energy based on, on, on fossil fuels. We could cooperate with Iran to, to upgrade and enhance their oil productivity, and we would benefit from that by increased supply of oil on the world market and they would benefit by income. That would then help reduce their demand for nuclear power, which we feel is a concern and certainly would uh, address their demand for nuclear weapons. Moreover, in a more general sense, we need to work to stabilize things in Iraq. We should encourage uh, unity in Iraq, national unity in Iraq, and I believe a sense of Iraqi nationalism, especially anti-Iranian Iraqi nationalism as a bulwark against Iran influencing Iraq and meddling in Iraqi affairs. Uh, that's not a dream. I think that there's a Sunni population that distrusts the Shia of Iran. There are, Shia, there are Iraqi Shia who dislike uh, Iranian styles of Shia Islam. And so Iraq has a basis for developing Iraqi nationalism. Let me close by reading just a, a short quote. I think this summarizes my feelings quite well. And it comes from a very good source. Uh, Mr. Shlomo Ben-Ami, the former foreign minister of Israel. Not a person I generally agree with on most occasions, but today I almost fully agree with him. He says, this was, about, this was a quote in, from 2006. He says, the question today is not when Iran will have nuclear power, but how to integrate it into a policy of regional stability before it obtains such power. Iran is not driven by an obsession to destroy Israel. This is an Israeli speaking. Iran is not driven by an obsession to destroy Israel, but by its determination to preserve its regime and establish itself as a strategic regional power vis-a-vis -vis both Israel and the Sunni Arab states. The answer to the Iranian threat is a policy of detente, which would change the Iranian elite's pattern of conduct. And that's why I think we should push for negotiations with Iran, offering them guarantees such as no preemptive strike, no efforts to uh, regime change in exchange for uh, their uh, backing down from, from developing nuclear weapons and then move forward with some kind of cooperation in developing their oil industry. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks for coming today. Um, I want to maybe fill in some of the cracks of things that haven't already, uh, already been discussed. I have the opportunity to uh, respond a little bit preemptively to some of the things that they've already talked about uh, but before we open it up for the question and answer. I, I guess one thing, uh, uh, I don't see myself as especially hawkish on the 
what uh, the U.S. should do in terms of foreign policy with regard to Iran, but uh, after listening to these two fine presentations, I'm feeling a little bit more hawkish than uh, either of my, my colleagues. Um, and let me just say one thing about that, which is that I, I think, while I don't disagree on a lot of the details that have been presented, I, I would maybe uh, be a little bit more um, suspicious of Iranian power aspirations in the region. I don't think uh, um, maybe that it's come out enough. Uh, Iran has been portrayed so far today largely as a defensive, uh, uh, threatened uh, country uh, when I think it's, it's probably fairer to say, and I think this was in the, the, the quote um, uh, that Professor Heyer just read, that Iran is actually seeking a, a regional hegemony. It's seeking greater regional influence. It sees itself as a, a, a state that ought to be stronger. Uh, and so there's not just a sense of threat. There's also a sense of uh, desire for nuclear weapons for prestige and status and the influence that will necessarily come from that. And we've seen uh, over the last 30 years since the Iranian Revolution uh, that this regime has sought to project its, uh, its influence uh, into its neighbors, uh, sometimes peacefully, sometimes uh, not peacefully. Uh, it hasn't uh, uh, technically invaded any of its neighbors, to be sure, but it has certainly uh, worked to destabilize uh, some of them at times, especially its neighbors across the Persian Gulf. Uh, so I, I think uh, I would take a, a less benign view of Iranian intentions, uh, while not saying that uh, um, I, I disagree that, that uh, we can't work through the, some of these issues with Iran through diplomatic means for, for now. Um, I, I would be a little bit less passive about that uh, in the long run. Uh, I thought in my presentation, the bulk of my remarks, rather than addressing, though, the what should we do question, uh, it would be useful maybe just to think through uh, some of the, the major options uh, as far as what we could do. What are, what are the policy options and what are the the weaknesses of those options. Um, the, uh, the bottom line message here is that there are no good options, um, but uh, maybe by addressing all of the possible bad options, uh, you all will uh, learn something about uh, which of these you dislike least. Um, w one option uh, is uh, the, the, the wait and pray option. Uh, this is to uh, uh, pray for regime change in Iran. Um, not an impossibility, uh, uh, given the uh, uncertain domestic politics and the uh, um, demographics of the country, the, the uh, large number of people in Iran uh, born since the revolution. Uh, um, there, there are any number of uh, ways that could happen. It, it seems to me uh, uh, unlikely to uh, um, happen in any kind of time frame that would be uh, useful to Western countries or to Israel, um, but, it, uh, but it is at least one of the options. Uh, second option would be some kind of persuasion or socialization, convincing Iran that uh, you know, all good civilized states uh, don't need nuclear power, that it isn't really threatened. Uh, I, this, is, uh, this is an option that we have uh, certainly uh, tried repeatedly over the years. Uh, I think also this is uh, an extremely unlikely kind of option. Uh, so I'll just mention it briefly. I, th I think Iran has uh, very strong motives for gaining nuclear weapons, not just because of the threats that it faces, but also because of the prestige and status that it would gain from having nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, I think this uh, far predates uh, the, the uh, 2003 uh, turning point that uh, Professor Al-Azam uh, suggested. I think it far predates the Bush administration and the axis of evil. Uh, I think uh, Iran has for, uh, for at least a couple of decades now uh, had, a, had a high goal of doing this. And the, the evidence that I would offer for that is that uh, even before the U.S. invasion of Iraq, uh, we had discovered a secret Iranian nuclear program. Uh, back in, I think it was 19, uh, 2002. Um, so if this was not a high priority for the Iranian government, uh, I, I wonder why they worked so hard to keep it secret for so long. Uh, I, I think this was a high priority. Uh, for my own interest in uh, economic relations, the best evidence that I can muster is uh, pictures. It, it, uh, you should go on the, the web and look for pictures of the newest Iranian currency notes. Uh, they issued new 50,000 rial notes recently. Uh, that have a picture of Iran superimposed with, uh, with an atomic energy symbol, uh, with an electron with, or a, an atom with the electron cir circling the, uh, the nucleus, and a quote from the Prophet Muhammad about uh, uh, Iranian scientists or Persian scientists reaching for the stars. Um, I, I think that the message is very clear. Uh, countries use their currencies to, uh, to say what their national identity is. Um, instead of putting 
uh, uh, George Washington on their currency, they put a nuclear symbol. Uh, I, I think that sends a message loud and clear about how ingrained this goal is for them. So uh, I don't see persuasion as uh, a, a viable option. So we're left with carrots or sticks. Uh, we've had a nice discussion so far of some of the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the um, economic um, inducements that we might offer, the security guarantees that we might offer, the negotiation route. Uh, I think that uh, uh, th those are all uh, useful options for us to continue to try. Um, as I said, there's no good option, so we should try lots of things. Um, I, I would point out that the, the U.S. in particular has relatively few ways to contribute here. Uh, the U.S. already has imposed so many sanctions on Iran that there are few new sanctions we could impose except for maybe some limits on uh, banking and financial uh, transactions that were highly useful in the North Korean case. Uh, we might, of course, promise to remove some of those in return for Iranian guarantees, but it's not clear what we would get back from the Iranians, a guarantee to not, quite, not try quite so hard to develop nuclear weapons, uh, to not boast about it quite so publicly. Uh, if, if you believe, as I do, that Iran intends to develop nuclear weapons, it's not clear what guarantees we could get um, uh, with regard to those nuclear weapons. Um, the European Union has more um, sticks at its disposal uh, economically. It, has, uh, it could impose more sanctions that it's been reluctant to do. Uh, but it's hard to see how we could isolate uh, an oil-producing country economically at a time when oil uh, is and will remain in such uh, uh, short demand. Uh, we won't get cooperation from China and Russia and other uh, uh, states on any kind of sanctions. Uh, so sanctions and uh, economic incentives along those lines are, are a useful range of foreign policy actions, but it seems, um, and, and it may have slowed Iranian nuclear uh, progress, but it's not a, a long-term solution to the problem. Um, the last uh, set of options, uh, and I'll, I'll throw these out on the table, uh, are the military options. Um, and I, I want to emphasize again that I'm talking about capabilities and options. Uh, this is not the part where I say Dr. Cooper thinks we should do this. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a question about could rather than, rather than should here. Um, uh, unlike the case with North Korea, uh, Iran's fellow member of the Axis of Evil, there are military options here, uh, or at least there are uh, debatably are, are military options here. Um, uh, uh, we could uh, use uh, some kind of military airstrike to uh, target some of the Iranian nuclear facilities, especially the uh, centrifuge, uh, centrifuges uh, before they become operational at the uh, uranium enrichment plant in Natanz. Natanz. Um, we could target the uh, heavy water plant at Erech. Um, there, there are uh, targets available. Uh, these targets are hidden underground largely. Uh, they're heavily fortified. Um, they're much harder to get at than Iraq's Osirak re reactor was in 1981 when Israel bombed it to try to set back uh, the Iraqi nuclear program. Uh, in part, obviously, the Iranians looked across the border and said, hey, if we put these above ground, we're going to get bombed too. Let's put them below ground. Uh, so so the, the targets are clearly harder to reach uh, than, than 30 years ago. On the other hand, the weapons are vastly improved as well. Uh, the, the U.S. certainly has uh, weapons that, that would show some capability of uh, um, attacking and destroying underground targets. Uh, interestingly, the uh, Bush administration over the last few years seems to have accelerated the transfer of some of these weapons to the, to the Israeli military as well. Uh, so that it is probably the case that Israel and the U.S. have uh, the capacity to carry this mission out. Uh, you may have seen in the news this summer that Israel uh, carried out a um, – uh, a, a training exercise over the eastern Mediterranean uh, that if it had been directed east instead of west uh, could have been seen as a trial run for a uh, bombing campaign over, over Iran. Um, I, I don't know what uh, uh, military analysts or, or intelligence analysts think the likelihood of success would be for a military attack. Uh, I have seen some open source arguments that suggest that uh, uh, an Israeli or U.S. attack on Iranian nuclear facilities would be as challenging uh, as the 1981 attack on the, the Iraqi reactor, but probably not any more challenging. So it would be hard to do, but certainly within the uh, range of, of capabilities of the U.S. or Israel. Um, and I'm, I'm, I want to be very clear that I'm not predicting that will happen. Um, uh, if it were going to happen, 
uh, sometime in the next six months or a year might be uh, um, a, a likely window of opportunity for that to happen, though. Uh, it's, it's an interesting time because uh, Iran is uh, coming close to fulfilling some of the centrifuge operations that it's, that it's setting up at its plant. Um, it's also an interesting time, though, in that you have major regime change in both the Israeli and the U.S. governments right now. So it's not clear who would make such a difficult decision at a time like this. Uh, what would be the effects or problems of, a, uh, of an attack? Uh, an attack on Iranian nuclear facilities, even if it were successful, would probably do more than, than slow down Iranian progress. It would not permanently stop Iranian progress. It might buy us five or ten years. Uh, it, but it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't destroy their program, and it, they would probably only try even harder afterwards. Uh, also, as, a, as Professor Heyer said, uh, there would no doubt be a range of uh, uh, Iranian responses. Um, he, he mentioned uh, increase in terrorism, which is certainly possible, although uh, I, I'm not sure that Iran is not already enthusiastic about its support for terrorism. Um, there's also the possibility of attacks on U.S. soldiers and, and bases in the Middle East. Um, uh, the more ominous threat is that Iran uh, has considered uh, and, and is trying to develop capabilities to suggest that it could block the Strait of Hormuz and block uh, oil exports from the Persian Gulf. Uh, it, uh, just this week we saw that Iran is uh, upgrading a, a military base, a naval base, uh, just, just outside the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, so it would be very, very costly uh, for the U.S. Uh, to, to get involved in something like this, not to mention the, the condemnation from world leaders that would, that would uh, surely be involved. Uh, it's not clear that it would have a long-term effect, uh, but it is, uh, it, it is one of the options on the table. Um, I'll continue to dodge the should question for now, um, but just conclude with, uh, with where I started, which is that uh, uh, I am less – sure that Iran is, uh, uh, doesn't pose a threat to the U.S. or, or its allies in the Middle East. Um, I, I think that this is uh, an issue where uh, w we should definitely consider um, all options, all of the sanction options uh, that are at our disposal, and that we should give serious thought to the, uh, to the military options as well. Um, I, I don't think that personally I would say that we're to the point where we should be using military options, uh, but, but all options should be on the table in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you to our three panelists. Um, interesting background information and ideas. Let's now open it up to any of you. Um, as moderator, I'll call on you, and if you'll stand and speak clearly and you can direct your question to the whole panel or individual professors if you'd like. Yes. Uh, so the question is whether the uh, dropping price of oil put, puts a crimp in Iranian ambitions. Uh, and the, uh, the answer is that, that uh, certainly the, dropping, the, the reductions in oil prices uh, do complicate life for Iran. It's no longer going to be as flush with cash for, for projects like this. Um, I would Personally, I think that this is uh, unlikely to put a serious dent in the Iranian nuclear program, though. Uh, they were uh, very comfortably developing nuclear weapons when oil was at $10 a barrel, uh, in, in the 1990s, um, maybe, maybe comfortable isn't the word, but they found the resources for it anyway. Uh, I, I think that speaks to the level of priority that this, that this is for Iran. And I, I think that this is such a high priority that uh, uh, Iran may have to you know, uh, uh, you know, spread things out over 18 months instead of 12 months to make its payments, but that it's not going to put, a, put uh, uh, serious limits on the Iranian nuclear program. Um, I re referred to that in, in my uh, comments when I talked about the, the negotiation option that one of the carrots we hold out to Iran is the fact that we would help them redevelop their oil industry. Iran's oil industry, of course, was developed with 
under the Shah and earlier, well, under the Shah, with uh, U.S. technology. And so they're dependent to a very great deal on U.S. spare parts and U.S. technology to, to maintain that infrastructure. And there's a, with the boycott, they're not getting that. So Iran's oil, in, oil infrastructure has been declining steadily over the last 30 years. Um, to the point that Iran, many of you may not know, that Iran actually has to import gasoline to fuel its cars. It cannot refine gasoline. And I was reading uh, one oil economist was estimating that in, you know, out some point in time, I don't remember exactly, that Iran could actually even become an oil importing country because its infrastructure would be so dilapidated. So I see this as an opportunity. The fall in oil prices and, uh, means that Iran needs to pump more oil in order to maintain income. And so I see this as a carrot to say, look, if we can move forward on the nuclear side of the deal, we'll give you some guarantees about regime change and preemptive war and things, and you stop and make, make it clearly, clear, clearly transparent through IAE that you don't have an ambition to develop a nuclear weapon. We would be happy to move forward and work with you on technology and build, rebuilding your oil infrastructure so that you can maintain your economy and maintain this living standard you have. So, so I see this as, as somewhat of an opportunity. Yes. I was curious. Um, China has good relations with Iran. I understand. How come they don't step in and just develop that whole infrastructure? How come? How come they don't step in and do that? Uh, they actually do. <laughs> Recent, they help. Uh, but I, oh, the question was uh, assuming that China has good relations with Iran. Why doesn't China step in and do these things? Um, China's relations with Iran are 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 okay. I mean, I don't think they're bosom buddies or anything, but. But China actually looks outside of China to develop its own nuclear power generation. There's opportunities for even Americans where GE were ambitious to get into China and help do that. And China certainly has a certain level of technology, but, but given the fact that the infrastructure was American built in the past, uh, maintaining that sort of same, same kind of technology, same genre of technology is important. So the Chinese can certainly help. But for the Iranians, they would rather not, their inclination would be go to, the, to, to go to the Americans, not the Chinese. That would be their preference. China certainly has an interest because China is an oil importing country and China would like to get oil from, from Iran and other Central Asian states and they do import a great deal. But, so there is some incentive, but I just don't think they can, they can fulfill what Iran wants. Part of, it, part of Iran's ambition is also to develop a relationship with the United States to enhance its own security so its regime doesn't feel, feel as threatened. And, and China can't do that. Go ahead. Uh, wouldn't it be not in the U.S. U.S.'s best interest, considering that we have a large portion of our uh, oil production industry is in refining oil and producing gasoline? Would that not be in our interest to help Iran not need gas for, uh, So is the question that uh, there, there are too many knots in there. I'm a little confused. So I is it in our interest to help Iran develop uh, uh, refining and processing technology? Is that the question? Yeah, considering that we have so much, our industry, U.S. industry is so invested in oil refining. Um, my, my sense in general would be that uh, um, a, a big part of the problem right now with uh, uh, scarcities, scarcities of oil is in scarcity in refining capacity. Uh, the U.S. doesn't have enough refinery capacity itself. So th there actually probably is some benefit in having more people building refineries. It's hard to build refineries in the U.S. because you have to put them in someone's backyard, and uh, people don't like that. Uh, and so uh, I don't think that there would be any economic danger for us in developing Iran's oil industry. Uh, we, we would actually have a uh, – uh, from the U.S. perspective, it's actually advantageous to have more oil supplies – in terms of crude oil, in terms of processed oil, the, the larger the supplies, the, uh, the, the better off the U.S. in general is. Yes. Right now there's a lot of talk about uh, using renewable sources of energy within the United States to have dependence from the Middle East from their oil, and also using more Western United States oil and Canadian oil and things of that nature. If we're actually to follow through on that and become much more Their relations with us, and in turn also the, the, the war. Uh, 
Well, initially it would have no impact on Iran because we won't import oil from Iran. And, and I'm not advocating that we uh, help rebuild the Iranian oil infrastructure. The primary thing is pumping and stuff, not refining, to, to benefit us directly so that they would, they would pump oil and we would import it. It would just put more oil on the market so we could go to our usual sources and others could absorb Iranian oil. So uh, I, I, at this point I'm not even advocating that we say, say, look, at you pump oil, we'll buy it from you because they can always sell it someplace else and we can get it from our other friends, other friends, not Iran. Um, Look at the whole non-fossil fuel generation of power and stuff is something that we'd all like to see happen, but, but, but we, are, we are generations away from that. And in the short term, we might as well pump Iranian oil. Now, one of the incentives for Iran to develop nuclear industry is they're smart in the long term. They know that their oil industry, their oil is a finite resource. And when they run out of oil, what do they do? And so they're looking ahead, and they want to be able to develop alternative sources of energy for themselves. So I think there is an incentive. I can clearly see an incentive for Iran to develop nuclear power. I can also see an incentive for Iran to, do, deal, to develop nuclear weapons. So I think we need to, do, to address that issue. Uh, China used to be a net producer of oil for its own consumption. Now it's a net importer. So China, China knows what it's like to go from, from a producer that can supply its own needs to a net importer, and this has serious consequences for global oil economies and the price of oil, the price of gas we pay now is due in a large part to the increased demand for, for, for fossil fuels by the Indians who drive more cars, by the Chinese who are driving more cars. So, so increasing oil supplies marginally from Iran would be good for everybody and us too. Um, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to be able to sort of give you exact details here. Maybe Scott can fill in the blanks there. But my understanding is that one of the reasons why we import so much oil well, from the Middle East and other countries around rather than pump our own is because it's so much more prohibitively expensive to explore, drill, and pump our own oil out. And as long as the price of oil remains below a certain level, I can't, this is where I'm saying maybe Scott can give us the exact figure, then we will continue to need to import oil uh, from other parts of the world rather than drill our own. And I know there's this kind of, when, when oil hit 150 something dollars a barrel, suddenly everybody sort of went really ballistic and said, no, no, we have to drill our own, and you have all this campaign media stuff going on about drill, baby drill, and all that. That's great. That's, you know, that sells votes. That kind of gets people stamping on, on, on the stage and all that. But the reality is when the price of oil eventually drops, and this goes through cycles, when the price of oil eventually drops to a more reasonable long-term level, is that price going to be uh, still viable for uh, us to drill and, and pump oil out of the U.S.? Because what company in the U.S. is going to invest billions of dollars or millions of dollars into, uh, you know, exploring and getting the oil? Getting oil out of Alaska and out down here is a very expensive process. Otherwise, people have done it a long time ago. And, and so we will continue to get oil from overseas until this price differential is corrected. And maybe Scott can sort of... Uh, I, I would say I largely largely agree with that. Although I would say that drilling for oil offshore in Alaska is not so much, not quite so much a price issue as a as a political willpower issue. It wouldn't be that expensive, that much more expensive to get oil from uh, from from uh, uh, new sources in Alaska. But it's politically costly to do so. And unless the oil prices, unless you're paying four dollars a gallon at the pump, there isn't the. And even then, there may not be. But there isn't the political will. To, to you know, mess up these pristine areas off, offshore and so on. The uh, oil is more. The, the question is. Um, oil from Alaska is, is uh, uh, very economically viable right now. Probably, probably at you know, between ten and twenty dollars a barrel. Oil from Alaska is very viable. That's that's more expensive than oil from, say, Saudi Arabia, uh, which is like three or five or ten, depending on who you believe. But it, but still, the, the price could come way down, and this would still be economically viable. The question is whether people are mad enough about oil prices to overcome the political roadblocks in the way of, of drilling for these sources. This also speaks to the original question about renewables, which is that it, unless oil prices uh, are at and remain at you know, $100 a barrel, $150 a barrel, uh, it, it simply isn't cost effective for most of the kinds of renewable technologies unless there's some kind of technological advance that, you know, may come 
10 years or 75 years from now. Let's go here. I think this is a great question. The question is, how do we know that Iran with nuclear weapons uh, wouldn't use them primarily for deterrent reasons? Why, why, why are we so scared about Iran with nuclear weapons to think that they would use them in some kind of offensive way? Uh, and I, I guess I would divide that question up two ways. Uh, first, I, I, um, I sleep better thinking that Iran probably wouldn't use its nuclear weapons. I don't think that the day after they get nuclear weapons, you know, they're going to you know, fire up the launch codes and send these into Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Uh, I, I, for the reasons that you outlined, I don't think that's a very rational thing for them to do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are uh, plenty of, of debates in the scholarly and intelligence uh, communities about whether states always make the most rational decision. Uh, uh, an Iran with nuclear weapons is an Iran that uh, even if we are, e even if you are 90% sure or 99% sure or 99.99% sure that they intended only as a deterrent, uh, we might lose a little bit of sleep about that 1% or tenth of 1%. Um, we, we, we might be a little, uh, a little nervous about that. The second thing that I would say here is that uh, in terms of drawing a line between offensive use and kind of just sitting back passively as a deterrent, uh, I think you're also missing the intermediate category, which is where uh, nuclear weapons are very useful because they provide influence and leverage. Uh, they, they, provide a, they provide a power resource that, that um, uh, just, just the ability to threaten, the ability to, um, uh, it, they, they, there wouldn't be an attack on the U.S. homeland, uh, but simply the fact that American soldiers in the Middle East were constantly living with, within range of Iranian nuclear mi missiles would change the bargaining power between Iran and the U.S., which is precisely why Iran thinks, or one of the reasons why Iran thinks this is a good idea, um, and one of the reasons why the U.S. thinks this is a bad idea. And, and, and I agree with Scott. I, I, I don't lose sleep at night about I Iran going nuclear because I believe it would be a deterrent nuclear force, minimum deterrent nuclear force. Probably. That's what I said. Probably. Yeah. I, I, maybe I'm a little more confident than Scott. Okay. Uh, but also, I believe that the Iranian regime is rational. That, that was sort of that was meant. My, my comment on Ahmadinejad was sort of just in that issue that there are, there are people in, in control in Iran who are who are much more rational and, than than he is. He's kind of a, a nutty guy. Okay, he's proven that. We don't need any more evidence. But he has no power. Um, so I think Iran has feels a need for them. But then, and I agree completely with Scott on the prestige factor. Uh, there's no great power that doesn't have nuclear bombs today. Um, so somehow you've got to get to the Iranians like we did other people, like the Libyans and the Brazilians and the South Africans and the Kazakhs, the Kazakhs and stuff, and say, you know, is the, what, what's in this prestige for you? That might not work with the Iranians because Iranian has it's a great civilization, it's a great culture, and something in their history leads them to believe that they, they should have some kind of they should have some greater status in the world, and nuclear weapons would bring that to them in a modern sense. So I don't know that we can talk them out of it, but I still think that we, we should try to, to engage them in discussions uh, to try to try to do that. Uh, whether we were ultimately successful or not it would, is, is still up in the air, because I have no doubt that, new, that given the chance, Iran would, would develop nuclear weapons. Uh, I think that's natural. Any state, if they were given a free ride, they would do that. And Iran certainly has the capability, has the technology and the know-how. So I have no doubt that they would do that. But, but it, it doesn't present an existential threat to the United States. Our, our allies would be threatened. Well, let our allies take care of their own interests. The Israelis can do that. Um, that would be the main target probably. Uh, soldiers, U.S. forces uh, you know, concentrated in the Middle East would be, would be, would be under threat. Uh, but 
But we, I think we could deter an Iranian attack on them because we certainly know where the bombs would come from, and we could. So I think we're, they would be deterred. I, in the sense, I'm a very classical person, very traditional and conservative. It's, it's a mutually assured destruction kind of scenario that they wouldn't use them because we would use them. We won't use them because they would use them. And so we're both deterred from using them. But they have that utility in the sense that they deter others from, from doing other things. Um, I mean, I think you go to the heart of the matter. It, I, personally, I think it's all about deterrence. I think the deterrence also feeds into the other issue that Scott mentioned, which I think I also briefly touched upon, which is um, the hegemonial interests of Iran. Yes, I, I agree. Iran has hegemonial interests in the region, and it sees itself as a major player and believes that anything that happens in that corner of the world, at least their end of the world, should also be run by them. They, 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 you know, and, and they see themselves as being a, a, a major power there. So in order to preserve their position, preserve their hegemonial interests, and also protect their regime, and regime survival is key here, okay, the, the, the nuclear deterrence becomes not just a viable option, or, it becomes an imperative option, okay? And it, perhaps if I just go back one second to, to sort of refer to something Scott said. I, Iran did, has toyed with the idea of developing a nuclear program off and on. But I think the 2003 becomes critical because that's when, you know, where it's been off and on, you know, we will, we won't, we'll do it in secret, we won't. 2003 was critical. That's when the, all, the, every, all the effort and the energy went into there. And I think it doesn't matter whether they have, um, you know, whether uh, they have a lot of income from oil or whatever. That's a number one priority for them, developing that deterrent and maintaining it in the face of what they see is a very serious threat and challenge to their um, existence and well-being, particularly with the presence of U.S. forces around. So the, the deterrence is there. Will they use that deterrent? Well, if you use a deterrent, it's no longer a deterrent. It you stops being – yeah, you, exactly. Use it, lose it. And I lose no more I, – I sleep in Damascus quite often. And I don't lose any sleep in Damascus thinking that the Israelis are going to bomb me. Not because the Israelis are, any, are more reasonable or they're more of a democracy or they're more of anything. Just because they keep that as a deterrent. And they're not going to, use, they're not going to waste that. They need that because just in case one day things really, really go belly up for them. And in the same way, I think I'm not going to lose any sleep on the Iranians losing, using it. What I do lose sleep over is that the rest of the region is suddenly thinking, oh, I've got to have one too now. That's where I lose my sleep. I don't lose my sleep on the Iranians using it or the Israelis using it, on each other or anybody else. Okay? It's not, you know, otherwise it stops being, my, my problem is when everybody else, every sort of, you know, tin pot little Gulf state will want one. And Egypt will suddenly want one. And everybody else, and that, that's, that's where I start to sort of worry about. And, and what happens to all the byproducts of this industry and so on and so forth. Do you worry about Syria getting one? Uh, Syria, by the way, uh, sorry. Syria, do you know that Syria has a nuclear mm -hmm. reactor and has had one for quite a few years? They have a civilian nuclear industry that's been going for, I think, something like almost 20 years. And it's under the control of the IA and everything. Mm -hmm. They already have one. It's in Deir ez -Zor. Not many people know this, do you? I guess one, what confuses me is, is why you think 2003 is a key year, because... The, according to the National Intelligence Estimate, this is the, the highest level U.S. intelligence estimate, is that Iran actually abandoned the development of nuclear weapons in 2003. Abandoned they abandoned the development of nuclear weapons. That was, that's, the, that's the latest U.S. intelligence, and that's what sort of took the wind out of Bush's sails of pushing for, for uh, an attack on Iran or that, that, you know, this was... I mean, since that National Intelligence Assessment came out, was it last year... Uh, the pressure on the U.S. government to engage in, Ar in Iranian negotiations has, has really toned down. Uh, so, I mean, I see the critical takeoff point is in the 80s. Well, of course, they had technology and things under the Shah, but in the 80s when they were being bombarded and savaged by Iraq, they really thought, you know, look, at the world's not going to help us. We better, get the, we better get the bomb. So the bomb was to deter Iraq or others that may have threatened them. So I feel, I feel less concerned about Iran now since reading that national intelligence assessment that says in 2003 they abandoned that project. Uh, for, uh, they didn't, I don't know what the reasons were. International pressure, too expensive. They didn't want, they didn't, maybe they didn't want to provoke 
uh, an American attack because things were getting pretty hot in North Korea at that time. The Bush administration and neocons were really, were really talking hawkishly, and so maybe this was an attempt to try to tone that down. I'm not, I, don't, I just simply don't know what the motivation was, but that's, that's what the intelligence was saying. Let, let's say this thing, and then I want to come back. And sort of yeah, this is a good point because I think we, we all three disagree with each other, so I'll, I'll try to attack both of them. Uh, it, uh, uh, get, get, get some debate going. Um, I, I guess uh, I, I do see uh, 2003 as a turning point, uh, and, and I, I agree with Professor Al-Azam that uh, uh, Iranian uh, activity increased uh, significantly in 2003. I would read that, though, not as a new commitment, but simply as a, as a public exposure. Uh, they had a program that was proceeding quietly, uh, gradually, but determinedly underground, uh, literally and, and figuratively. Uh, when it was exposed in 2002, uh, suddenly they started taking lots and lots of actions in 2003 to uh, uh, hurry it up because they knew once it was exposed there were going to be efforts to shut it down. So I think they started rushing in 2003 precisely because they were exposed in 2000, 2002. On uh, Professor Heyer's point about the national intelligence estimate, um, this is a uh, this is a very controversial document, and, and I guess we could spend the rest of the day talking about different uh, interpretations and the bureaucratic politics of who wanted this said why. Uh, but I, I read that estimate very different than Professor Heyer does. Uh, I think that the CIA um, stated quite clearly that, uh, that Iran had dropped parts of its nuclear weapons program, the parts leading to kind of final capacity to take uh, highly enriched uranium and put it in a bomb form and put it on a missile. Uh, I think that the estimate also says very clearly that Iran uh, continued with the other 90 percent of the program uh, and that, that Iranian efforts to um, uh, develop uh, highly enriched uh, uranium uh, ur enriched beyond what's necessary for civilian nuclear energy, uh, as I read it, continued after 2003. Uh, so I think that the CIA report has been uh, frequently misread to suggest a kind of termination of Iranian activity when I think they, they actually decided let's do the hard part first before we spend a lot of time on the most controversial final step. Technologically, the final step is not the hardest step. Uh, it's not uh, going to be a very time consuming for them. It's one that they can uh, that, that they can hide more easily. So I read the national intelligence estimate as, as uh, very misleading. Uh, and, and the public debate about the national intelligence agent, uh, assessment, I think, has uh, misleadingly suggested a stoppage where there was, in fact, no meaningful stoppage. I, I think what you're saying has a lot of merit. And I actually agree with you, but not in the way that you're necessarily couching it. Because I think we're missing the real point. You see, um, what a lot of people don't realize, and I, w I really wish, this is where I really wish we had our nuclear uh, physicist here, because he could sort of kind of correct me if I'm sort of losing my way. But as I understand it, really a nuclear program is not just developing a bomb. Um, actually putting to, you know, the, the actual making of a bomb, as far as I'm told, can be done in any high school lab if you have the right components. So it's not really a very difficult thing. The real difficulty is in actually delivering this bomb to an exact target and then getting it to go kaboom. That's where the real difficulty lies, not in actually assembling the bomb. The, the, the assembly of a bomb is fairly low tech, okay? And the Iranians have that technology and they can do it any time. So in that sense, uh, Pr Professor Scott is, is, is right in that um, the bits that they need to go to the last part, they probably already have that sort of, and they're keeping it, uh, you know. What I think the Iranians focused on, especially post-2003, is the delivery mechanisms. Look at where all the Iranian effort's gone. It's gone into developing their missile systems. The missile systems are going to carry that payload and deliver it at whatever chosen target's going to go. Um, until, I think very recently, the last missile test, I think, I believe now Iran has the capability to reach parts of sort of uh, central, well, middle Africa. They can certainly reach southern Europe. They have a medium-range ballistic missile. Okay, and so they have bits of Europe, well, substantial bits of Europe and uh, parts of the Middle East within their range. And that missile is, I, my guess is that it is, I, I don't know, I don't have the actual technical specifications, but from what I understand, it's perfectly capable of carrying a nuclear payload. So in terms of the nuclear material, the bomb itself, um, you know, I think the Iranians are more than capable of buying nuclear 
you know, plutonium or weapons-grade uranium if they want. Kazakhstan is awash with this stuff. It's been awash with this stuff since the, 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 uh, the 90s when uh, the, the West went in and dismantled all the ballistic ICBMs that were kept there by the Russians and has something like, I can't remember the figure, it's 300, either 300,000 kilograms or three tons of, of I, I can't remember the exact, it's a 300 something uh, of, of, of uh, weapons grade plutonium that's lying around. The Kazakhs have been screaming for years for people to come and take it off their hands and nobody will take it off. It's that kind of stuff that's lying around, which I'm sure the Iranians, should they really want, can go and get their hands on it. And once they have that, they don't, so the whole issue of them making their own, uh, you know, weapons grade uranium, I think that's a lot of it is just show. It's a lot of it is the national pride, the, the kind of we can do it for ourselves. I think if they really, 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 when it really comes down to it, um, they may well already have the uranium they need. They may already have, and it was just getting that missile technology ready. And I think that missile technology is ready. So the, going back to your original argument of they're just saving the last components to put them together. I agree. Um, I I hate to disagree when you agree, uh, <laughs> but let me do it anyway because I'm an academic and I like to disagree. Uh, and I would say that the, in many ways the hardest step I, I still think is, is uh, creating the weapons-grade uranium. Come, finding uh, finding non-weapons-grade uranium uh, is, is uh, possible, but I still think that technologically the hardest step in the process is taking the uranium and uh, basically filtering it to the point where it becomes suitable for for weapons use. That's what the centrifuges that you sometimes hear about at the uranium uh, enrichment plant in, in Netanz are, are intended to do. Uh, Iran has put enormous effort into, into buying and installing large numbers of centrifuges here over the last uh, uh, three to five years. Uh, I, I think this is the step that's most crucial. Uh, this is the step uh, which has been most challenging in the past for uh, aspiring nuclear powers. Um, I, I think that once you have that highly enriched uranium, uh, it, it is still something of a technical challenge to, to weaponize that and put it in a small enough form to put it on a missile. Um, but I, I think Iran is, is putting all of its efforts into the, the, to the hardest step precisely to give itself the option later on to either use or not use that highly enriched uranium as it sees fit for, you know, for, for military use. But Iran is still a long way from being able to do that. I mean, the level of enrichment necessary, there, there, there are ways from doing that. And so while the NIE says that, that certain aspects of their nuclear bomb process have been maybe on hold and they're proceeding with other aspects which have a dual use, it could be for energy uh, generation, it could be for bombs. For, for me, this then presents just the, just the right moment when, when, when negotiations uh, are possible in that Iran has, has, under international pressure, has backed away from some of the things that it was doing. And let's assume for the moment it was international pressure that did that. Um, and if we and the rest of the world, the, the Europeans and the Americans and the Russians and the Chinese, step forward and, and give them some confidence that we will not, that, that, that they don't need a nuclear deterrence, and we offer them some carrots, economic assistance, technological transfer, and things like that, we, we may in fact be able to back the Iranians down from this. And, and that may, and, and if we can't, we don't lose anything. We, we haven't given anything to them. We haven't like legitimized their regime in any way. We simply negotiated with our enemy. Uh, we have maintained our strategic flexibility. We could always go back to sanction. We could always go back to the hard line if the negotiations don't work. But I think Iran is, is, at, a, is at a moment now when they may be more open to that. Uh, and so, I mean, in, in all cases, I think we should keep war on the table as an option, not the best option by any means, but negotiations might be the, the, the best of these bad options. Let's go to the next question, is that okay? okay. Can, let me just respond to one thing really quickly, which is I think Iran does have the te technology to enrich uranium right now. Um, it may take them a while to get it done. Uh, it may be three or four years before they get all the centrifuges installed, the, the uranium, uranium you enriched, and they're willing to go to the next step. But they are not lacking the technological capacity right now. 
Uh, they are not lacking the, the centrifuge, centrifuges right now. Uh, the course that they are on, it's really just a matter of time. Now, that may mean that we have a window of opportunity for negotiation, and I'm, I'm not debating that point, but technologically, they are, they are at and beyond that threshold. Let's go here. Sorry, if I've understood the question right, what you're suggesting is that the nuclear issue is part of a bipolar struggle between Israel and Iran rather than Iran having its own sort of aspect. It's, I, I think not. I don't think it's a strictly, as you say, it's a bipolar struggle between Israel and Iran. Um, Israel is a factor. Um, Iran sees its influence uh, if you want, uh, being spread or, 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 or um, extended through various groups such as Hezbollah, for example, in, in South Lebanon. Um, uh, Israel sees Hezbollah as a threat, um, so you have, uh, the, you know, a, a, a conflict by proxy, if you want. Um, Iran sees itself as an Islamic power and therefore sees itself as a potential guardian of Islamic um, faith, Islamic holy sites, Islamic um, traditions, etc. Um, Israel is seen as a potential threat or uh, by holding on to Jerusalem or by, you know, oppressing a, a potentially Muslim population. You know, Iran in, in its conflict with the main Sunni, the Sunni mainstream uh, states, it sees itself as being the real savior of, of Islam and, and Islamic people and sees that the mainstream Sunni states, your moderate states, if you want, your moderate Arab states, have failed, is, have, have failed Muslims, have failed the Palestinians, and therefore it has at, at, at different times seen itself as a potential leader or a, a, a proper replacement. In fact, this was one of Ayatollah Khomeini's big issues with the Saudis, you know, where he addressed them and said, you are not fit to be the keepers of the keys to Mecca, hand them over. You know, you, you shouldn't be in charge. We should be in charge. We're the true Muslims here. And so there have been incidents. But to see it purely and simply in a, in a bipolar sort of conflict between Israel and Iran would, would be a gross oversimplification and not the case. The fact that I, I, Israel, you know, needs for its own sense of well-being uh, to have a bogey out there. All right. There has to be an enemy, a big bad enemy that it can then turn around to its own people and say, you know, you have to support. You have to, and, and to the world, no, you have to support. You have to support our policies. We, we, we not only serve a strategic interest, but also we are threatened by this. You know, the Arab world no longer really poses a threat to Israel, and Israel has proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Iran, however, is another. You know, is an unknown. So it serves, from an Israeli point of view, it serves a, a, a good. Uh, it serves the purpose of basically acting as that evil out there that, you know, Israel stands as the last bastion to hold back the tide of whatever and, and in a way protect the West and the rest of the world. So the rest of the world has to support Israel. So Israel feeds off that. And the Iranians at the same time need also an, a, a gross evil in the region that they can also fixate on. So, but it's not, these are incidentals. The, the real issue is not there. Yes. Right now, we're not doing anything, and so we don't we don't want deterrence, and not because we think they'll bomb people, but we don't want another you know semi cold war in the Middle East. But it seems like we need to do something because I've read in various sources that it's in about three or four years they're going to have the cap that capability, and as soon as that happens, it's off. So we need to do something. And my question was kind of um, about bargaining with them and about offering them those tech those technologies. That assistance, that aid, opening up, opening up negotiations, 
kind of how it works in Korea, uh, North Korea. Will that work for Iran? Can we do that? Uh, so the question is, um, why we we talk we've talked about having the military option on the table, and but we haven't done anything with it, and we. And in three or four years, Iran will probably have a nuclear weapon if nothing's done, and we don't want that. But, but, so, but my question would be to back to you is what's wrong with doing nothing? I mean, uh, if Iran got a bomb and there was nuclear deterrence, it's not the end of the world. I mean, Pakistan and India got them, and that's actually brought some stability to that relationship. Uh, we would have a new Cold War in the Middle East, but, but frankly, the Cold War is kind of a nice thing. I mean, remember during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States was, was a relatively peaceful period of time in world history. It got kind of bad after the Cold War ended. So, so having a Cold War and having nuclear deterrence, in other words, this is a very traditional argument. I mean, having a mutually assured destruction is not such a bad thing. I mean, the Israelis and the Iranians deterring each other, so there's no war in the Middle East because anybody that provokes war might feel that the Israelis or the Iranians could be drawn into a nuclear holocaust. That's not a bad situation. I mean, it worked with the Soviet Union and the United States for, for a long, long time. And the world got, got a, lot, a much meaner place after the Soviet Union collapsed and after that, that deterrence was gone. Now, so that's one argument I'd make about the, the deterrent thing. But secondly, I would say I, I don't like the proliferation of nuclear weapons because I do believe while deterrence is, is a reality, there is always miscalculation, there's always miscue, and there's always a chance for, for the failure of deterrence. And, and it's not because of irrational, crazy people, you know, just launching these things. But it's miscalculation and misperception. I mean, we came so close to nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis that it's scary. And the more, the more states that have nuclear weapons, the more likelihood of some miscalculation. So I don't like Iran going nuclear, and that's why I have pushed for engaging them in some, some discussions to try to avoid that. Because if they go nuclear, why wouldn't the Saudis want to? Why wouldn't the... Uh, you know, others want to go. And then you have a uh, nuclearized. I mean, the, the idealistic option that none of us have proposed at this uh, here is, is a nuclear free zone in the Middle East. Because frankly, oh, did you? Okay. But frankly, Israel is not going to, is not going to go and denuclearize. Israel, and we know that. So the talk of a nuclear free zone is just, that's really idealistic and, and, and sort of. Yeah, I mean, this was all, yeah. <laughs> Let's, let's put credit where credit is due. Israel did start this. <laughs> and, 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 uh, but so, so, in other words, I'm saying a nuclear free zone in the Middle East is not an option. A mutually assured destruction is an option, but I don't think it's the best one. Frankly, I'm happy with just having Israel have the nuclear bombs. They've been real good about keeping them in the basement. And, and then we avoid the proliferation problems. But, but, but a nuclear Iran, and this is where I differ with maybe Scott to some degree and others, is that it's not a nightmare for me. Uh, because, I, first of all, it doesn't threaten the United States now. It could in the future if they had ICBMs, but, but the Israelis will take care of themselves. And uh, I, I frankly don't think the Iranians would ever bomb Jerusalem. I just, I just can't quite imagine an Islamic <laughs> State bombing. I live in Damascus, which is like in between Tehran and Jerusalem. You know? That's not a good place to be. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I, I can't. I can't. <laughs> just don't feel good about it. It might be. A, yeah, that's right. They you might not. Be, sleep well in the U.S. Look at the map. I, I've been living in the map all day. So they might not be the best shots, you know, uh, but, but I, don't th I, don't think, I don't think Iran's going to ever target Jerusalem. I just don't see an Islamic country taking down the Dome of the Rock and El Aqsa Mosque. Over here in the Yes. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think you raise interesting questions. Well, of course, every state is entitled to defend itself. Um, but it's not just, you know, Iran, as I said initially, it's not just about Iran defending itself from hostile U.S. In, US struck Western intentions. And believe me, the West has had unpleasant thoughts about Iran ever since the... Uh, you know, the, the, the 50s with the Operation Ajax when they, they did try to have a, a, a secular democratic state under uh, Mossadegh. And, 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 you know, the, the CIA and the British sort of trashed that one and, and put the Shah back in place. And it's been downhill ever since. Um, 
but it also feeds into Iran's hegemonial interests as well. Iran doesn't just see itself as this nice, gentle, polite sort of uh, kind of state that just sits there and wants to be left alone and doesn't. You know, Iran does have regional interests and does have uh, regional aspirations, and uh, a, a, a nuclearized Iran would help and assist in that. So I think I think we need to kind of yes, Iran has a right to defend itself. But are we willing to also recognize Iran's right to exert its influence in the region? That's, and that's a, a clear issue. The, uh, sorry, remind me of the second part of your question. Oh, the presidential elections. Yes, to a certain extent, but I don't actually see the presidential elections actually making that much of a difference in terms of our position vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, yes, maybe a, an Obama administration might be more willing to engage, but will there be fundamental um, shifts in terms of uh, U.S. policy with regards to Iran or the region as a whole? I, I don't know. Um, one last comment in terms of the military option, which we keep sort of touching on. You know, the, the military, I, I spoke to, a, 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 this is back in 2007, um, uh, I spoke to a CIA fellow who uh, happened to be hanging around here, and he basically said to me, uh, if I were not sitting on the Iraq desk right now, I would be sitting on the Iran desk planning our next sort of move into there. The only thing that's stopping, that was stopping his department from actually working on the Iran issue was the fact that they were engaged in, in, in Iraq. That was just before the surge, the whole thing of the surge. It was just before it. Um, but I would also hasten to remind you that Iran is not Iraq. Iran, Iraq is a flat country, you know, with lots of, you know, it's, it's tank country. If, you, if you're a military person, you don't understand. Okay, Iran is much more complex. It has a huge population. It's, it's something like 80-something million. Okay, it's, it's mountainous. It's complex. It's um, powerful. It's rich. You know, and, and, and those installations that you were talking about, Scott, yes, they're very deep down, and I... I disagree with uh, what you were saying. As far from the stuff I've read, it would take nothing short of a small nuclear bomb to crack them open, really crack them open. And nuking Iran to stop it from developing nuclear uh, capability would just somehow, th 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 there's, there's something unsavory about that. <laughs> um, anyway, but there you go. Um, I, I think that the, uh, th this is a good question. Uh, uh, let me speak to the first part first, which is don't we threaten them? And I, I think the answer is that if, uh, if, if we were Iranians sitting around having the same discussion, uh, we would, like Americans, we would see ourselves as bas basically peaceful and non-threatening. Uh, uh, we would, 90% uh, of us would agree that we should, as a country, uh, uh, step up to our rightful place in world history by developing nuclear weapons. And uh, uh, we would certainly see the U.S. as a threat to us. So I think it's a good question because if, if, if we put ourselves in their shoes, uh, yes, Iran ought to see, uh, see the U.S. as having made threats to it in the past, as having uh, overthrown its governments in the past, as being hostile to it in some ways. I, I, I certainly think those, those things are all true. Um, from my perspective uh, as an American, I see them as more threatening to us than vice versa. But I, I can understand why they feel differently. Um, the, the second issue is uh, the issue of the, the election. And I, I guess I would say that there's, there's a little bit more at stake here with regard to Iran. Um, I think that uh, the McCain, uh, a McCain administration uh, is more inclined to be tough on Iran, uh, less likely to uh, uh, pursue the kinds of negotiation offers or, or, or more reluctant to pursue the negotiation strategies that Professor Heyer and, and Professor Al-Azam have laid out. Uh, I think uh, an Obama administration, uh, I don't think we have any clue what an Obama administration would do. I don't think, um, I, I don't think there's enough history there to know what, what they would really do. Um, I, I think that they're tending towards a, um, an emphasis in the campaign, certainly, on negotiation and diplomacy as their primary differentiation from the, from the current administration, but it's never clear until, this, until a new campaign takes office what they actually will, will do with power. Uh, that could just be a way of differentiating themselves from the Bush administration. But, but I do think that they would be less likely initially to pursue uh, military kind of options. I also think, incidentally, that kind of raises the stakes for the Bush administration in its waning days as it thinks about uh, the possibility of, uh, 
maybe the likelihood of Obama uh, taking power in, in January, uh, they might think, you know, this guy isn't going to do the job. Maybe we ought to do the job before we leave office. So I do think it makes the next uh, three months uh, kind of interesting. Um, and, and lastly, I would just uh, – uh, there, there, there is a lot of debate on how capable we would be of hitting uh, Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, from what I've seen, I think that there, there are very capable ways of doing that. I, I disagree with the idea that you need nuclear weapons, but this is – we don't know. You know we, we won't know until someone bombs it and tries and, and decides, hey, we needed a bigger bomb. <laughs> and and I, I agree almost completely with Professor Cooper, which is something that we rarely do. Uh, and that's – so in answer to your question, yes, I mean, keeping the nuclear option on the table does threaten Iran. That's the purpose of it, to threaten Iran. Uh, because when you threaten people, there's an incentive for them to do something to, to try to reduce that threat. Now, they can reduce that threat by developing a deterrent, and we don't want that, or they can reduce that threat by engaging in meaningful negotiations, which we should try to do. And so, like with the North Koreans, who I think, by the way, are much more difficult to negotiate with than the Iranians, uh, we try to walk back down and, uh, you know, act for, commitment for commitment, act for act, we give them assurances that we will not engage in trying to change their regime, even though we don't like it and we think it's despicable. It's better than many other regimes that you could imagine um, in other places in the world. Um, we give them some guarantee that we won't invade their country if they don't develop nuclear weapons. And then we begin working on positive things together, like oil development and other exchanges. We, we, this is not new. This is not something. This is exactly what we basically did with the North Koreans. We gave them a, 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 an assurance that we would, this was the Bush administration gave them an assurance that we would not topple their regime. Uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, we gave the Cubans an assurance that we would not invade their country. And so we we do these kinds of things when we're trying to back down from from these this precipice of potential war. But but there's no incentive on the Iranians' part to do anything unless the, unless the uh, the, the uh, military option is left on the table, because at some point they have they will understand that there is a red line that they that we that they may cross, and we don't know exactly where that red line is, and we don't want them to know exactly where that red line is. But at some point there is a red line they may cross, and then we would exercise the military option. Uh, the worst of all the options we have, but I think it still has to be left on the table or else there's simply no incentive for Iran to do anything. That, that, I, made, I tried to make that point just very briefly in my own comments that, you know, for, for, for 20 years we did try to uh, contain China and we had a, a virtually total embargo against China. And then in 69 we began to engage them and China's changed in a revolutionary way since then, in a very positive direction, although there are many difficult and unseemly things about that regime there. Uh, economically, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it's a different world by so many times. Uh, so I, we've only tried this with Iran for 20 years, but it, it still hasn't worked. So, yeah, I, I see in, engaging in negotiations as a way to try to move beyond these. Uh, I'm not a proponent that would say drop the sanctions to sweeten the incentives. I think we should, we should keep the military option on the table and keep the sanctions in place so that the Iranians have incentives to enter into meaningful negotiations. And then as we progress down those negotiations, we beach, meet benchmarks and we, we allow – uh, we allow certain types of trade to take place. We allow certain types of exchanges to take place. And, and, and gradually we, we do this. We did this with the Chinese where we moved from virtually no trade at all to minimal trade to some trades in, in weapons, some trades in high technology and, and, and other things. Uh, and, and so yeah, it's, it's a paced process, and it's, that's what we're trying to do with the North Koreans. Although let me just – I think the North Koreans are much more difficult to deal with than the Iranians, much more difficult. Uh, well, I don't.
don't know about unstable. Uh, unstable kind of implies that somehow they're about to collapse or implode. I don't think the situation in Iran is that dire. The Iranian pendulum has been swinging sort of from uh, more conservative to more moderate uh, for some time now. And, and th this, this sort of swinging motion may give this impression that perhaps the regime is unstable. But I think in its fundamental um, makeup, it's fairly, um, fairly secure. Where we are seeing some movement is um, from a more conservative to a more moderate. And there is a push for more moderation. So I, I don't think we can anticipate a major collapse or, or a, a, a U-turn change in terms of uh, what the Iranian regime looks like. But what we may be able to see is a move towards a more moderate, more reasonable sort of regime that perhaps we may then feel a little more comfortable in talking to. Now, I would just point your attention to the fact that over the summer, um, Iranian statements, particularly from Ahmadinejad and his sort of, uh, you know, group of, um, let's say, let's call them uh, more extreme, um, the, yeah, the populists, okay, um, we're, we're, we're becoming so uh, kind of provocative and, 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 and uh, dangerous that the Syrians um, uh, be became worried and, and actually started to kind of uh, look to other, they, they were getting concerned enough to, uh, to start to look for other alternative venues and options uh, and, and paths, and, and, and that's what kind of got them talking to the, uh, to the countries, and, then, and that's what started them talking to the Israelis and so on and so forth. And at the same time, in Iran itself, we hear that some clerics, and some of, and some of those clerics, not just on the more moderate side, but even from the conservative side, were stepping up and criticizing Ahmadinejad and his more extreme statements. So even from his own conservative wing, some of the conservatives felt that this was going too far. So you could say that there has been a toning down, if you want. But at the same time, uh, I, I noted that sort of as far as missile technology tests, etc., you know, the, the traditional stuff, that's still going on full flow. But the more explosive, the more kind of... Uh, Provocative stuff has been done. So that kind of moving back and forth, that's a, that's, that's a normal day-to-day <coughs> -day affair of Iranian settlement. I don't think they're on the, on the verge of collapse, but I could be wrong. I, I don't know much about Iran. It's an it's a absolutely fascinating society. And, and, it, and, and let me just underline the point I made in my thing is, is many people see this as some kind of totalitarian Islamic regime. It's not totalitarian at all. It is, it is a very, very divided society with moderates, conservatives, radicals, and everything. And so it's like, you know, it's like a kaleidoscope. Every time you twist it just a little bit, everything realigns. And so, uh, you know, it, it, Iranian democracy is about like BYU, USA, BYUSA, is that what we call it here? The student government democracy here at BYU, where everybody has to be vetted and, and pass the ecclesiastical endorsement before they can run in, a, in an election. And Iran has elections. People are voted in and out of office. But there is a threshold that they have to meet in terms of being being sanctioned by the by the grand ayatollahs and things, and uh, so it's absolutely fascinating. It's, it's almost five o'clock. We have to say something to keep people excited. <laughs> Another question? Yes. Well, I think that is a good question. I, I would say that uh, um, looking down the road, uh, it, it seems fairly clear to me that the winner of the U.S. invasion of Iraq was, was the Iranian government. Um, that, that's uh, my personal opinion, is that Iran gained more from this than, uh, uh, than, than we did, and uh, certainly more than Saddam did. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to overestimate that. I think that uh, we, we've already talked a little bit about Iraqi nationalism. 
there is a, a, a strong uh, strain of resistance to Iran there. Uh, it, it's not the case that a, a Shiite-dominated government in Iran is going to become kind of a, a puppet of, uh, of, of uh, Iran. Um, this isn't going to be a Syria-Lebanon kind of situation. Um, you know, going back to when, when Syria um, fairly closely controlled Lebanon. Um, but I do th occupied and then continue to control. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm thinking about prior to a couple years ago. Um, what, uh, but I do think it means that uh, uh, Iran, th this is another way that Iran has gained influence. It, it will have a at least sympathetic regime in power, assuming as you did th that the uh, uh, that the Shiites maintain uh, majority control for the foreseeable future. Um, I, I don't think that they're going to be harmonizing things completely with Iran, but I do think it, it, it adds to Iran's power that it will have one more friendly state. And just a historic footnote, the, the guy, that, you know, our guy Chalabi, the, the, the darling of the Bush administration and the Defense Department, not the CIA and the, and the State Department, Mr. Chalabi headed to Tehran about as soon as he landed in Baghdad. So even the guy that we were promoting, that the Bush administration was promoting, to move in and sort of take over uh, knew quickly that he had to have good relations with Iran to survive. But, but I would agree with Scott that I think the Iranian, the Iraqis uh, are not just going to roll over to the Persians. I mean, they're Arabs, you know. Can I give a grim prognosis? <laughs> I'm going to be really depressing here. I think in invading Iraq, we undid the last 20 years of efforts of containing Iran. We basically set it up so that now the Iranians have a lot more. In fact, they have everything they could have dreamed of short of occupying and, and, and sort of establishing themselves in Iran. I think uh, to kind of the, to hope that somehow Iranian, uh, Iraqi nationalism will, will somehow prevail and that uh, the Iraqi Shiites will uh, appeal somehow to their Arabness and, and that will counter Iranian influence um, is, is to hope for too much. I think Iranian, Iranian influence, clerical influence, um, you know, and so on and so forth is going to be uh, too strong and at the very least Iraq will, for the foreseeable future, once the U.S. troops leave, be a, uh, a comfort zone for Iran. Okay, I'm not going to say it's going to be an Iranian satellite or an Iranian sort of uh, 20th province or something, but it will be a comfort zone. It will be somewhere that Iran can kind of rest and feel comfortable about having under its, um, its wing. And I think that uh, the... Uh, the only thing, the only saving grace here that might kind of still keep us, if you want to keep a little candle flickering there, it's that the, the power of uh, someone like Ayatollah Khomeini, who really was considered to be a super supreme leader, and his word would be heeded by everyone, has been waning uh, and, and, and gradually sort of eroding with, with every passing generation, if you want, or, or the appearance of a new supreme leader. So today, the current supreme leader, the current Ayatollah of Iran, does not wield anywhere the kind of influence that someone like Ayatollah Khomeini uh, would have wielded. And if you want a good example of that is the sort of influence that Iran holds over a group like Hezbollah. In the uh, days of Khomeini, uh, Fadlallah, the founder of, uh, of Hezbollah, would have had no, there, there would be no dispute. If, if Ayatollah said do, it was done. And um, once Ayatollah Khomeini died, you find that uh, groups like Hezbollah basically carved their own, they, they don't feel the same sort of loyalty and, and adherence. Having said that, um, you know, there's still a very strong relationship. So I think Ira Iraq will be a, a nice comfort zone for Iran, but, you know, not, not a satellite state. Personally, that's exactly why the Iranians want a nuke. 
to basically, you know, put an end to this constant idea that somehow we have to destabilize Iran, we have to somehow dismantle Iran, we have to sort of deal with that. You know, in, in a way, this is a self-feeding prophecy. If we keep sort of going on about what a terrible threat Iran is, it will become a terrible threat. Um, I think we need to deal with Iran at its own level. We need to look at Iran's regional concerns. We need to look at Iran's hegemonial um, and, and security interests in the region and say, okay, well, you know, we think you have a case here and here and here. And, you know, in return, we'd like you to consider that we also have regional interests and so on and so forth. The problem is that I, I think we could have negotiated with Iran in 2003. We could have even negotiated better with Iran before we'd gone into uh, Iraq. Going into Iraq without some sort of Iranian uh, coordination was a catastrophe, I think. Um, you know, we would have done much better in Iraq had we gone in with some sort of Iranian sort of liaison, like we did in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, I, I think we need to stop seeing Iran as this kind of, you know, one step away from the devil that, you know, the sooner we destroy them before they destroy us, the better. And more of a, a regional force that, okay, we don't like everything they do, we don't agree with everything they want, but at the end of the day, we have to deal with them. The, the better it will be for everybody. I, I essentially agree. I'm not a proponent of regime change. I think re, uh, pushing regime change would increase instability in not only in Iran, but in the broader Middle East uh, in a way that I think we can't imagine what the outcome would be. I think the diversity of Iran, the ethnic diversity of Iran, is a positive thing. And if the Iranians are given some, some sense of security, they, they can then turn their attention more to, to reforming their, their political system, building their economy, integrating minority nationalities into mainstream society and things and we could see Iran turn around, much as we've seen in China. I mean, China has a long way to go, but China is an ethnically diverse country. Uh, it's a more totalitarian regime. But integrating China into the international economy and the international political system has had, has had enormous benefits for the daily lives of the Chinese people. And so uh, we gave up regime change long, long ago in China, and, and we've given it up in Cuba. We've given it up in North Korea. I think we should give it up in Iran, too. I, I'm not into regime change. I think it's just a very idealistic kind of neoconservative kind of ideology. The external threats always bring out the worst in people. Yeah, they do. When, when, a, when a nation is threatened, it coalesces. So, the, sorry. You, you reduce the power. To Basically, when, when, you know, when, when the, the thing that kept Stalin in power in the Second World was the fact that the Germans invaded him. Perhaps had they not invaded him, he might have sort of fallen away. The thing that uh, held Iran and, and cemented Ayatollah Khomeini's power was the fact that Iran was threatened. Otherwise, maybe uh, the civilian government that was the, the, the secular civilian government that initially was set up might have um, uh, been able to establish itself and, and gain. Always, external threat basically does not usually force a nation to rupture. It forces it to pull together and brings out the worst, you know, in it. I guess uh, I wasn't going to address the regime change issue, but because we've had uh, uh, the, these two opinions so similar, I kind of feel compelled to uh, counterbalance a little bit. Uh, I, but I'm only going to be slightly more hawkish, and I would say uh, I think regime change in, uh, in Iran would be more of a wish than a goal. Uh, this is something that we should want to see happen, but actively trying it and pushing it is, prob is probably a mistake, and it will probably, it will probably backfire on us. And we, so, but if it happened, I, I would think that would be good news. Uh, we've raised the specter of uh, instability in Iran. I, I think Iran causes all kinds of regional instability for its neighbors anyway, just with the status quo. Uh, I, I don't think a, a, you know, a, a couple years of chaos in Iran would uh, noticeably increase the uh, um, dangerousness of the Middle East. I think the Middle East is a mess anyway. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm a little bit more uh, apathetic about that, but, again, but I don't think I would push for it because I don't think it would be very productive. Um, but you can, you can go home and pray for it. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, regime change doesn't mean something catastrophic. I would like to see regime change too, but if, if Iran evolves into a more democratic society, that's a regime change for me. Uh, I'd rather see a, a soft landing than a crash. And maybe afterwards, Professor Heyer, 
Larry, you can tell us how our uh, engagement with China has made them no longer a threat to Taiwan uh, and how we, there's no chance of us going to war with them because of all our strong economic ties. But we'll save that for the hall afterwards on, on, on a different subject. I, I, let me just say, I have a 5 o'clock appointment, so I need to take off. But I was going to say China that... China, one more time, we're going to have that fight. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, when you talk about regime change, why are you automatically assuming that it will be for the better? It could be for the worse. Remember, Iran is actually a functioning democracy, just as Eric described it. You know, you could end up with a regime change that could give you even more hideous. Can you imagine Ahmadinejad with real power? That could be a form of regime change. <laughs> no, you know, so we need to be careful of what we go and pray and wish for. You know, let, 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 if you're going to be start the prayer you know, way, we better put some clauses of exactly what we're praying for, not just regime change. But thy will be done. So. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I think the U.S. already has such minimal ties with Iran that there is not much to divest from. I, I think what's happening now is mostly symbolic. Um, the, there are plenty of businesses and especially oil executives who would love to do business in Iran who have been prohibited from it for, for decades. So I think that there is uh, almost nothing that the U.S. can do to, to reduce our economic ties to Iran. Uh, what we have tried to do is we have tried to extend those to our friends. We have tried to persuade and uh, coerce our European friends and uh, our partners in Russia and China and elsewhere to follow our lead. We've had some success in getting uh, uh, European and other kind of uh, democratic states to you know, reduce their ties to Iran. I do think that that has uh, made life more complicated for the Iranians. Um, I think the, the one thing that the U.S. could really do in terms of reducing ties is something that proved very, um, very useful in getting the North Koreans' attention, which was uh, we uh, – and we started down this track already. It has to do with the banking sector. Uh, we uh, declared that uh, U.S. That, – that banks that were doing business with North Korea could not do business with American banks. Um, American banks are kind of important to the world economy, as we're seeing in the news over the last few weeks with the financial crisis. So lack of access to the American economy versus lack of access to the North Korean economy was kind of a no-brainer for lots of banks who did uh, divest from, from uh, ties with North Korea. Uh, we are starting down a similar path with Iran. We have blacklisted a couple Iranian uh, banks and financial houses uh, that, uh, with the hope of kind of maybe gradually increasing that to put more pressure on the regime. Uh, there, there's lots of evidence that this got the North Koreans' attention. There's some hope that it might uh, uh, get the Iranians' attention. But notice that we are not talking about reducing American banks' ties to Iran because they're already negligible. It's reducing the ties of other countries' banks with American banks if they don't reduce their ties to Iran. So there's a kind of indirectness here, and I think that's um, what – as far as options for the U.S., that's what's kind of possible. Let me raise one more thing on this broader issue of sanctions, which is um, there, there's a lot of discussion about our economic options and we should negotiate, we should bargain, we should offer them security guarantees, we should, we should offer them all kinds of incentives. Uh, and I would just say that, that that's – well, I don't fundamentally disagree with that. The, the best evidence against that strategy ever working is that the Europeans have been doing this for decades with very little success. So it's not as if no one has been trying to negotiate with Iran uh, for the last several decades. The Europeans have begged, pleaded, cajoled. They've offered, you know, they've offered the moon um, with – and it seems like Iranian nuclear programs are accelerating rather than decelerating. Um, just a couple of points here. Um, I, this is a little experiment we've run a while back. Um, one, a barometer of how well an embargo is doing is whether you can get Apple iPhones and iPods or not. Okay, Syria and Iran are both under similar sanctions. Do you know what one of the best places and cheapest, you know, some of the, you know, the really nicest iPods and, and iPhones I've seen on sale are where? 
Tehran and Damascus. You want, you want a good iPhone? I can get it for you for around 150 bucks. That's what they go for. And they, and, and, and they work on any network. They're, op they're open for any network. You just plug and play. Um, so, you know, that, that's how effective these embargoes are. If, if iPhones and, and iPods are getting through, you can imagine what else is getting through. Um, you know, the other thing about North Korea, you know, I hate to say this, but I think North Korea is just such a terrible example to bring up in comparison. With, North Korea is a black hole, okay? When, when, when nighttime settles down, if you're looking from space, they, they, there's just this, there's South Korea all lit up, China, you know, and then there's this black hole, which is North Korea. North Korea has nothing to offer back. Iran is not North Korea, so we can't sort of kind of say, oh, well, this worked with North Korea, it might work with Iran. Iran is a very complex, large country with, uh, you know, it, it, it's a player on the international market in terms of um, oil and so on and so forth. And also don't forget, Iran is actually quite self-sufficient. Iran makes its own cars, okay? Iran uh, manufactures a lot of its own, it has a strong manufacturing industry. So, you know, sanctions, yes, they irritate, they annoy, they may even hurt it to a certain extent. And maybe if we, but at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to kind of uh, pressurize Iran the same way we may have been able to pressurize um, a country like North Korea. Because, just because of, it, it's, you know, it's incompatible. I don't want to say, you know, they, they're stronger or tougher. It's just you can't do that kind of comparison, I think. Um, and, and, and so it, it doesn't work. I think, you know, if we want to deal with Iran, militarily or economically or whatever, we have to tailor make whatever response we want to make to Iran uh, for Iran. And yes, you're right, the, the, the Europeans have been trying for, you know, God knows how long. And, you know, for, <laughs> for those of you, you know, well, that's just Europeans. They're wishy-washy. I don't know. <laughs> I think we should thank our panelists and thank you all for being here. If you want to come up and any final questions or comments, but we'll adjourn it officially and thank you all for being here today.